Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight's development and training. We're asking, Lord, that you enrich every life in Jesus' name. Open up our spirit of understanding and reveal your truth to everyone. I will pray, Lord, the word will not leave us where it met us, will progress, will move forward. And your power will work in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, We're coming to First John chapter 2. And I'm reading verses 7 and 8. First John chapter 2, verses 7 and and eight, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, in verse eight, a new commandment I write unto you. Which thing is which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Here John the beloved, an apostle, one of the twelve, writes to the church, and the apostle is bringing to us the new commandment. In verse 7 it says, this is old. You've heard this before. Because you know he was writing as the last writer, author of any of the epistles in the New Testament. Because Matthew had written about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You've heard this before and it's not new. And John and also reaching the gospel before this time, he said, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You've heard it before. It's an old commandment which is the word of God you have heard from the beginning. Again, he says now, in a renewed way, a new commandment I write unto you, which sin is true in him. You come to Christ, and then there's the privilege of hearing this new commandment, a new life, a new creature, a new covenant, a new attitude, a new disposition, a new spirit, a new heart. This is new because the darkness is past, and the light now shines. We're talking tonight on our new comprehension of the new covenant. Our new comprehension of the new covenant. It's one thing to have the commandment, sorry. It's a new comprehension of the new commandment. The new commandment. The old man, the old nature, the natural man, the carnal mind, the dead spirit, the uncircumcised heart cannot understand, cannot fulfill, cannot obey the new commandment. It takes a change, a transformation. It takes conversion. It takes a new thing and experience happening in the heart before we can even understand the new commandment or obey the new commandment. The self-centered man, the selfish man, and the one who is only thinking about himself, his own joy, his own happiness, and his own progress, and his own promotion. The self-centered man cannot fulfill the new commandment until the darkness of ignorance passes away, until the darkness of the old nature passes away, until the darkness of Satan's nature passes away from our hearts, from our understanding, 
And from our disposition, we cannot fully keep to the new commandment. The new commandment is deep and wide. We need a new experience, a new heart, a new spirit, a new faith, a new self-forgetfulness, a new vision, a new focus to truly obey the new commandment. Come back to that again in verse 8. In verse 8 it says, Again a new commandment write unto you, which sin is true in him and in you, because, it says, this is how you understand the new commandment, because, this is how you experience the new commandment, because this is how the new commandment will become revealed through your life, because the darkness is past, and the new light shines, light will shine. In our hearts, light will shine. We will not continue in the darkness of the old nature, in the darkness of the unbelieving heart, in the darkness of the old understanding. You see, there are people that say they are Christians, and if you look at their lives, they do not commit the outward sins. The one you can say, look at this, look at that, but then their attitude, their principles, and their habit is still like the old life, like when the darkness was there. If that's your case, something will turn around today. In all our lives, something will turn around today. You can say, Amen, I will not close the meeting. Look at John chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 34. Here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the captain of our salvation. He says, a new commandment I write unto you, that she love one another. He says, there is no period at all you can take vacation from this. It says, a new commandment I write unto you. It's a new day. It's a new dispensation. It's a new covenant he goes to establish on the cross of Calvary. And he says, as a result of that, a new commandment I give unto you, that she love one another. As, you see, that's the important word there. Because there was love also in the Old Testament. As David loved Joab, or as Absalom demonstrated love to David, or as the widely wise woman came to tell David his story, don't love like that, or as so and so loved such and such, it says forget all that. It's a time of ignorance. All those Old Testament characters, they operated and they worked under some kind of darkness. And the Lord is saying, the darkness is gone. I'm the light of the world. And you have seen us show love to you. Visible, transparent, and noble. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that she love one another as I have loved you. Peter, you remember how I loved you? And I said, heaven has revealed that to you. And when you did something wrong, and you said something wrong, I showed my love in rebuking you because you are yielding to Satan. Do that to yourselves, among yourselves. If something goes wrong, don't be a grudge. Don't hold it back. Don't say, I will not say anything. But the thing is burning and eating up your lungs, eating up your, your heart. Say it out. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. Do it in love. It says, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. We we'll love each other. Somebody there said, we we'll love each other. By they shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. 
by the way, how does this love come into us in this new day, in this new dispensation, on that day's new covenant? How does that love come? Look at this in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because, look at this, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Not in our heads, not just in our mouth, not just in meaningless action, not in pretense. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Tell me the rest there. By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You see, when we're born again, the Spirit comes to be our aid. In fact, it's the Spirit that bears witness that we're children of God. When we're sanctified, it is the Spirit that talks, all, talks to us louder and deeper and richer and it tells us we have a new heart, a new spirit. And when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, now he comes in. He was with us. When you are born again, the Holy Ghost with you. If any man does not have the spirit of Christ, it's none of his. And then you are sanctified. It becomes more prominent in your life. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then the Holy Ghost now fills you. And he lives within you. And by his power and by his love, you operate. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. What does that mean? It's shed abroad in our hearts. When it sheds in the light, all the darkness will vanish away. Anywhere grudges are hiding, all that will vanish away. Anywhere hatred is hiding, all that will vanish away. Shed abroad and it saturates our heart. And it's by the Holy Ghost that now we love. I pray this love will be visible in our midst and in every life in Jesus' name. Our new comprehension of the new commandment. Three things we're looking at. Number one, as we look at this chapter in First John, reading from chapter verse 1, all through to verse 14. What do we learn here? What's the Lord telling us here? Number one, the new commandment under the new covenant. The new commandment under the new covenant. If you don't come into the new covenant, and if you are not totally established in the new covenant, you'll not have the new commandment being fulfilled in your life. You'll be going back to some examples of the old covenant, of the old testament, and you will not really have the love of the new covenant and the love of the new testament the new commandment under the new covenant the lord will do it for us the lord will do it in us look at point number two the never ending condemnation for numberless compromisers there are people that will not have this new commandment the new commandment of love the new commandment of compassion, the new commandment of mercy, and the new commandment of reproducing the love and the life of Christ. And they will indirectly, they will behind the door be manifesting the attitude and the actions of darkness. And they will be treading in, in even the bad, bad examples of the old covenant. And they compromise our understanding on the new covenant and on the new commandment. And they remain in darkness. And the Bible says, the word of God says, they have never ending condemnation on the, for numberless compromisers. Point number three, the notable characteristics of no church concourse. No church concourse. Concourse must be nurtured. Indirectly, it's like saying that even champions must eat. 
champions must drink water. The people who are powerful and the people who are strong and the people who are healthy and the people who are all right, they are healthy, there is no sickness, they must keep on nurturing themselves. And in the same way, in the spiritual way, in the spiritual understanding, when you are a conqueror, thank God I'm a conqueror. I said, thank God I'm a conqueror. You'll be a conqueror in Jesus' name. You must nurture the characteristics of being a conqueror in your life. Because if you don't, what you don't feed will eventually get weak. What you don't feed will eventually get sick. And what you don't feed eventually will die. The characteristics of the conqueror will not die in your life. At every corner, you will overcome. Every opportunity, you will overcome. Every challenge, you will overcome in Jesus' name. The notable characteristics of nurtured conquerors. We are coming back to point number one. The new commandment under the new covenant. New commandment under the new covenant. We are coming back to chapter 2 of First John. And I'm reading from verse 7. I'm reading from verse 8, brethren children of God, born again people, those who are members of the family of God, I write no new commandment unto you. What are we preaching today that you have not heard before? I write no new commandment unto you. What are we studying today that you have not heard before since you became a Christian? What passage are we reading today? And what reference are we reading today that you have not heard before? That's why it says, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. From the beginning of your Christian life, you've heard this. From the beginning of the Christian faith, when Christ was with the disciples, we've heard this. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. We heard it before, but we didn't really analyze it. We didn't deep, go deep into it. And we have not been actually operating on it every time we come to the service, every time in our families, every time in our places of work. Because of that, it's a new commandment. We're going to look at it now, have new understanding and have new experience. A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him, and it is because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. It will shine in every light. Look at chapter 13 again of John. I want to show you something here. Chapter 13 of John. And we're reading from verse 30. John chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 30. Look at verse 30. It says in Bastachi, He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Who is this that went out? Let me hear you. Judas Iscariot. It was after Judas had left. The betrayer was no more among them. The traitor was not among them now. And the one that had been hiding under the pretense of, I'm giving money to the beggars, I'm giving money to the poor, and because of that, I'm making this arrangement. That's why I'm absent now. It's gone. And it's never to return back to the midst of the children of God. That it was after that time Jesus said in verse 34, now you're all my disciples. Now you're all born again. Now you're children of God. And you're clean by the word that has spoken unto you. The backslider is gone. The traitor is gone. The betrayer is gone. Now in the midst of the people that truly believe, and your names are reaching in heaven, and you're not lost souls, a new commandment I give unto you. 
that she loved one another. Judas couldn't have practiced that. He was so self-centered. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. He wanted something so bad that the Lord said, if you do this, it were better you are not born. All the same, he wanted to do that. He was incorrigible, and he was stubborn, and he was naughty, and he had superfluity of naughtiness in him. Now he's gone. Now the people that are submissive to the word of God, and the people that are truly saved, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's what you have to consider every time we are thinking about how shall I relate with my brother? What shall I do with my sister? And how should I respond to what somebody has done just like what Christ would have done? What Christ would have done? A new commandment I gave unto you in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2. Fulfill my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That's the new commandment all the time. Don't think about yourself. Think about other people, their joy, their happiness, their progress, their promotion, and everything good you want for yourself that you desire for them. Fulfill the joy of the apostle and the joy of the Lord himself, that she be like-minded. Don't always say, I'm different. I want to be different. I'm not like him. I'm not like her. And I always want to keep my own peculiar personality. Be like-minded. You know, if we're not like-minded, you will not think about my good. I will not think about your good. If we're not like-minded, not, you'll not think about my joy, and I will not think about your joy. I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. I want to be fulfilled. I'm not thinking of my brother and my sister. Be like-minded, having the same love. Having the same love. Many times it's what we can get from people we're thinking of. What we can achieve in this situation we're thinking of, and we're not thinking of what's he going to have? What's his joy? What's his fulfillment? How can I be an instrument of joy and fulfillment and life unto him? How can I be a fulfillment of the great promise God has given him? How can I be a fulfillment of the great provision the Lord has provided for him? having the same love, being of one accord. Not always disagreeable, not always contradicting, not always criticizing, not always wanting to have your way and trample upon other people, of one accord and of one mind. Of one mind. That means you cannot say, I have a mind of my own. I have the plan for myself. I think differently. They will never understand me. And I'm not going to try for them to understand me. Love does not think like that. The love of Christ does not think like that. I don't want to understand them too. Let them do whatever they want to do. I don't want to know the reason why they do what they do. And they will never guess the reason why I do what I do. I'm going to be a peculiar person that irritates everybody, offends everybody, and I'm going to just be myself. He says, no, that's not the new commandment. He says, no, that's not of love. We must be of one mind. Look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. And you know, people who strive and they have been glory ordinarily, they might be nice people, good people, good-natured people, but once they have an ambition and once they have a goal, that goal, that ambition now makes them to have a strive. Before that ambition came, 
before that goal came, before the pursuit of that thing, we just think another person too might be pursuing before that time, the gentle people. The nice people, the good people. But once that ambition came, that desire came, and they are watching that desire, they are no more watching the new commandment. They are watching that desire. And if anybody wants to stand in the way, that's when the strife will come. But it says, if we have the same mind, if we have the same love, if we are one accord, one mind, there will be no strife, there will be no vain glory. What's vain glory is lifting up yourself, pumping up yourself. Why do you have to do that? You do that because you want to look better than that person, higher than that other person, greater than that other person. You want to show that all the other people around you are not qualified to have this privilege, this position, this possession. And for you, for people to know that you are the only qualified, capable person, that's why there's been glory. So he says, let nothing be done through strife of being glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let, tell me, let tell me there I can't hear you I want you to preach and you are not preaching use your voice let each esteem other better than themselves each brother esteem other brothers and sisters better than themselves let each sister esteem other people, other children of God, better than themselves. <clears throat> you know, if you have that attitude, you'll never belittle anyone. You'll never gossip and say negative things about anyone. You will never trample on anyone. And you will never give the idea, I'm the only good person here. I'm the only righteous person here. I'm the only sanctified person here. All the others, they're nobody. Don't reckon with them. Reckon with me. If I'm there, you don't need any other person. If I'm doing it, you don't need any other person to do any other thing. I am the number one. And the others are not even good enough to be number two or number three. They might be far away, number 13, number 20, but I am the one. You see, that will not be the new covenant. And that will not be the new commandment. And that will not be the new way of life that Christ is exposing to us. Look at verse 4. Look not every man on his own things. That's the new commandment. Look not every man on his own things. What does that mean? This is my section of the work. Once this section succeeds, the church is all right. That other person may fail. That other person may fail. That other person may crumble, be crushed. That's all right. Because once I'm there, and my area of work is perfect. All the others, they matter not at all. That's not love. And that's what makes some people to kind of exalt themselves, exalt their position, exalt their responsibility, exalt their duty. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How will my brother succeed? I want to think about that. And I want to encourage him to succeed. I'm not thinking of myself. You're not thinking of yourself. While I'm thinking about you, you are thinking about me. You're growing. I'm growing. And we're moving forward. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
Let this mind be in you. That's the mind that was in Christ Jesus. Think about others. Help others to succeed. Help others to be happy. Don't just say, once I'm happy, that's all. Once I'm all right, that's all. No, that's not all. One single tree does not make a forest. We must all be happy. And it's the left hand washing the right hand, and the right hand washing the left hand. That's how the hands will be clean. We shall be clean. Look at Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 10. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Where there's love, will not speak any word deliberately that will hurt our brother, that will hurt our sister, that will make them feel so put down, so belittled, as if they're nobody. But all the time, will be kindly affectioned. And you will not think about your own state of mind. You know, some people, when they are hungry, they are angry. You know, some people, when they are looking for something, they've not got it. It's like the whole world has crumbled. Don't go by your feeling. I have this. I don't have this. Don't even think about yourself. Be kindly affectioned. One to another with brotherly love. In honor, in honor, in honor, <clears throat> preferring one another. That's the brotherly love we're talking about. That's the new commandment that Jesus has given us. <clears throat> that in honor will prefer other people. And you have to be deliberate about that. You have to say, you first, I'll come after you. You have to say, this is something only one person can do. And I've been doing quite a lot. I give you a chance to do that. And this is something only one person can stand on. And therefore, I'll come after you. Go ahead and have the first place. When last did you think about that? When last did you actually practice that? Has that become your habit that in honor you prefer other people? God will help us. All right, God will help me. He will help every one of us in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 24. Look at verse 24. Let no man seek his own. That's the law. Let no man seek his own. Uh, have you known the people that pray? Uh, they pray a lot. They pray in the day. They pray in the night. They even fast. But you see the problem is, look at all their prayer items. It's so that I will be this. I will be that. There's no time they remember the person next to them. That they too, they need to have such opportunity. Lord, make me a vibrant Christian. Make me a successful minister. Make me this, make me that. Let there be no obstacle before me. Let there be no hindrance before me. When are you going to also include the next minister to you? When are you going to include other people around you? Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth, another's progress, another's prosperity, another's success. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, even as I please all men in all things, Paul the Apostle says, I'm not always uh, carrying, uh, you know, the title of the Apostle uh, high up. I am this, and I want everybody to recognize that. This is who I am. I want everybody to recognize that. And I'm looking for respect and honor at all costs. 
He says, no, I'm thinking of other people. And I'm pushing it to you. And I'm giving you exhortation that you too will be like that. Even as I please all men in all things. Not seeking my own profit. Not seeking my own profit. There are people who say they are Christians. They are even preachers. They are pastors. And they are ministers. And if anything is going to rub on them, that they will not have their honor or their profit or their exaltation or their respect from other people, they react violently. They react angrily. They react in such a way you will know that something is wrong. They are on the wrong side of the Christian love. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, the profit of many that they may be saved, the profit of many that they may be sanctified, the profit of many that they may be strong, the profit of many that they may be spirit filled, the profit of many that they may not be distracted from the goal of their life. It says, that was I, that's what I seek, and that's what you ought to seek. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, and become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. No life. No profit to anyone. I speak in the language of men of, of angels. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and could remove and all faith so that I could remove mountains. If I have not charity, I am nothing. Look at that. Christ looks at us and he says, it's not the gift. Is the grace. It's not what you're able to do. It's the fruit of the spirit of love in your heart. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and have not charity, love, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long, quietly, silently. You see, the people don't know any better. And if they don't know any better, and they make me suffer, if I retaliate and make them suffer, we're the same. We're in the same class. We're in the same group. They're carnal and carnal. Because of their carnality, that's why they're always thinking about themselves. And then they throw something at me. And because of my own carnality, we're in the same class. Were in the same disposition, I throw my own back to them. But charity, love, suffered silently and suffered long. And it's kind. In the midst of the suffering, you remain kind. It's easy to live with you. It's easy to walk with you. Charity envies not. Charity wants not itself. It is not popped up does not behave itself unseemly. Tell me what follows that. Tell me. Tonight your voice is cold and it didn't rain today. Tell me out aloud. Seeketh not her own. That's love. That's the new commandment. And that's what the Lord has given us. That you're not always seeking your profit. And you're not seeking, always seeking your progress. And you're not always seeking this more be mine, this more be mine. I must have recognition. I must have promotion. I must have exaltation. I must have this. I must have that. Seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. Why do we get provoked? I was expecting something. And he, instead of bringing that thing to me, honor, exaltation, respect, esteem, is doing the opposite. Instead of lifting me up, is bringing me down. Instead of making me happy, 
is making me unhappy. And so I am provoked. I am angry. And you know, when you go on that line, on that journey of provocation, big things will start provoking you. Later, smaller things, smaller things, smaller things will be provoking you. A little thing that is even done accidentally will begin to provoke you because you've gone too long on that journey. Thinketh no evil. When you are provoked like that, you are not thinking good now. You are thinking evil. How can I hurt him? How can I throw it back to him? How can I injure him and say be a Christian? How can I contradict him and say be a Christian? How can I cut him down and say be a Christian? You'll be thinking evil. I pray God will save us from all that in Jesus' name. In Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 2. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's bodies. Bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. <clears throat> and so fulfill the law of Christ. The new covenant is rooted in divine love and is reflected through Christ's love. Christ's love is implanted in the heart and his compassionate love is expressed through our lives. With his love in our hearts, we keep the law of love. We think the thoughts of love. We speak the language of love. We offer the sacrifice of love. We commit ourselves only to the actions of love. You see, when we are preaching under the new covenant and we are obeying the new commandment, the law of Christ is the law of love. Others may contradict that law. Others may oppose that law. Others may even forget about that law of love in their lives. But you say, whatever other people do, however other people behave, however other people misbehave, I have the law of love always to obey. And then you think the thoughts of love. As you think about your brother, as you think about your sister, you don't allow their immaturity to irritate you. You don't allow their difference of opinion to irritate you. You don't allow their level of education, a level of whatever, which makes them act the way they are acting, you know, to, di to distract you. You keep on having the thoughts of love towards them. And of course, in your language, you speak the language of love. Before you speak, you say, if I say it that way, it will hurt him. It will hurt his feeling. Already, he is uh, less than he should be. And if I say this, it will do some harm unto me. And you know, in the life we live now, it's not only saying it by word of mouth. You can send a text to somebody. And the text, you're asking yourself, will this be love? When he gets, when she gets this text, will that make him excited and happy? And will that make him to say, I'm on top of the world? You see, we must speak and write and text and phone in the language of love. And we offer the sacrifice of love. Sometimes you need to sweat a little. Sometimes you need to put some pressure on yourself. Sometimes you need to go the extra mile, extra mile that will help you to make some sacrifice and you need to commit yourself to only the actions of love. The best we can do for others is to love them enough to desire their salvation and to desire their security. 
and to desire their sincerity and to desire their steadfastness and to desire their, their sanctification. That is the new commandment. And then in our life, we'll always be walking, always be living by that new commandment. God will do it in every one of our lives. Say, we'll do it in my life. Higher love in Jesus' name. Greater love in Jesus' name. A bit one love in Jesus' name. Look at First John chapter 2 now. I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 2, verse 4. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. The Lord has given us the new commandment. And he that says, I know him, I'm born again, I'm a child of God, and he does not keep his commandment, he doesn't even think of the other people, and he's not keeping the new commandment he has given us. The Bible says, John says, the Holy Ghost says, the Lord says, He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. I'm saved, not keeping the word of God. I'm sanctified, not keeping the word of God. I'm a minister. I'm a servant of God. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. I'm going to heaven. And when the rapture takes place, I will be there. And yet, it's not keeping to the word of God. It's a liar. Look at verse 9. He that says is in the light and hateth his brother. is not keeping the new commandment. He hateth his brother. is in darkness even until now. Because he can quote a few verses of the Bible. I know that verse in Genesis. I know that verse in the Psalms. I know the verse in the Gospels. I know that verse in Revelation. Because of that head knowledge, it says, I am in the light. But there is hatred in him. He hates the voice of a fellow brother, a fellow sister. He hates the walking of a fellow brother. And if that fellow brother, that fellow sister, has a peculiarity, has a deformity. It's not the, the brother, the sister. It's not guilty of the deformity. If he could help it, he would not be like that. If you don't like that voice, if she could help that, she would not have that kind of voice. If she has a kind of face that turns you off, and you say, my problem is I don't even like his face. If she had choice, if he had the choice to make, he would not choose that kind of face. He was born like that. But you see, there are people that hate their fellow brother and they hate their fellow sister on something they cannot change, on something that doesn't have any moral value, on something that doesn't offend God. God loves him, he saved. God loves her, she is saved. And yet, in the things in which God loves him, loves her, you hate him for that, and you hate her for that. Think about it. Anytime any ill feeling rises up in your heart, does Christ feel like this towards this brother? Does Christ feel like this towards this sister? If somebody is in fellowship with God, God is happy with him. God is happy with her. And he is happy with God. She is happy with God. And there is no demarcation at all. No wall of partition between him and God. And yet you hate him for his action. You hate him for his attitude. And yet he's in good relationship with God. There's a problem there. You have a problem. You will not hate the people God loves. I will not hate the people God loves. Uh, you know, you know, sometimes in the home, husband and wife, a little thing has happened. Breakfast is a little bit late. Dinner, a little bit late. Five minutes, 
15 minutes. Think about that. And then uh, the husband is irritated. The husband is unhappy. Countenance will change. The voice will change. Attitude will change. Something you wanted to give her before, you cancel that thing. No promise being fulfilled anymore. Think about it. Is God unhappy with the five minutes delay? Is Christ unhappy with her with 15 minutes delay? Why are you angry at what God is not angry at? Always consider if this does not offend God, I'm not offended. If that does not offend Christ, the head of the church, I'm not offended. We must not have an attitude that Christ will not approve of. You will be like Christ. I will be like Christ. We will be like Christ in Jesus' name. You know the offenses people have against any of us because we've done this and we've done that in the carrying out of our duty. We do what we think is best. We do what we think will profit the church. And somebody there looking at our responsibility and what we're doing gets angry, gets irritated. Another person near him commits adultery, is not irritated. Another person near him is stealing, is not irritated. Another person near him is telling a lie, is not irritated. But when we are in the path of duty and we happily, joyfully do our duty, then he gets angry. That person is not like Christ. We will be like Christ. I will be like Christ. Our church will be like Christ, the head of the church in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is no occasion of stumbling in him. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is no occasion of stumbling in him. Have you uh, noticed some people that have left the church? And when you confront them and ask them, why did you leave the church? They say, well, it happened like that. And you probe, you delve into it, actually. There were some people in the church that decided to make my life miserable. And they decided that if I was going to be happy in the church, abide, remain in the church, I have to be their slave. I have to listen to them. I have to bend to them. I have to carry out whatever they wanted. And you know, brother, let me tell you the truth. I began to fear them more than I feared God. I began to think of them in anything I was going to do more than I thought about Christ. And I just saw that I was a big zero, a big hypocrite. Because of that, I just felt there's no point. After all, while I'm there, that person is going to oppress and oppress and oppress if I don't do what they want. And I saw that I was uh, making them the center of my life rather than Christ being the center of my life. You cause other people to stumble when you do that. And you cause other people to forsake Christ and to leave the work of God when you do that. That's why it says in verse 10, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Verse 11, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. And he knoweth not whither he goeth. He knoweth not. These are the people that brag, I'm going to heaven. If anybody gets to heaven, I'm getting there. 
and I'm not going to sneak into heaven. I'm going to get there, and there'll be great ovation when I enter. And they have hatred in their hearts. They have animosity in their hearts. And they have unreasonable anger in their heart. No anger is reasonable, but their own, there's no, not even ground for it. And they carry, they are pregnant with anger. And they never deliver that pregnancy of anger. It says that hatred, that anger, that animosity makes them to be in darkness. In fact, they do things secrecy. They won't allow you to know what they're doing. They're not in fellowship with the church. They're not in fellowship with the brethren. Darkness, secrecy, darkness, hypocrisy. He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and he walketh in darkness, and he knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You will not be like that. I will not be like that. What's the point of preaching and preaching and preaching and there's hatred in the heart? What's the point of preaching and preaching and preaching and honestly contending for the faith once delivered into the saints and you are in darkness and then when the rapture happens, um, you know, you are left behind. And then you wake up and you realize, how could I be left behind? Because I'm a preacher. And because I know the Bible, and because I earnestly contend for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, you are pugnacious, you are fighting, you are striving, you are vain glory, and you are anger, bottled there in the heart. That's why you miss the rapture. Brother, you will not miss the rapture. Sister, you will not miss the rapture. And you need to think your reaction. And your lifestyle, will this make it on the final day? I pray you'll make it. Like I will make it. I say like I will make it. Look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 11. For this is the message that she heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. The message is still there. That we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, killed his brother. You understand? At that time, the only thing he could use was the instrument of iron, whatever, and clubbed his brother to death. Today, there are people who use their pen, they use their phone, they use some information, they use tail bearing, they use wrong information they give to other people to kill others. They kill their character. They kill their courage. You know, somebody becomes born again. It's a child of God. Somebody is a worker, a new worker. And somebody is a preacher. And is bold. And is courageous. And is outgoing. And is confident. And then there are people like Cain that will use an instrument of cruelty. And they kill his excitement. And they kill his courage. And they kill his self-confidence. You will not be a king. I said you will not be a king. Because his own works were evil. And his brothers righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Hatred is from the world. And if you have hatred, it means that you are the world. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. I love the brethren. I love the brethren. You are always near the people you love. You know, somebody comes and is sitting nearby there. And you're looking for a place to sit. That person is there. I'm not going to sit in that row. Why? There's something in your heart. 
If you loved them, you want to be near them. If you loved them, you want to associate with them. There are people that love their sinful relatives more than they love the children of God. And you never see them laugh. You never see them happy. You never see them brighten up. When they are with the believers, they wear this long, sorrowful, gloomy face, and they say it's because they are sober. Well, watch them. When they get to their sinful relatives, when they talk to their sinful relatives, how happy they are, how joyful they are, how excited you, they are, and you say, ah, so and so, look at him. I don't know that he ever laughs. I don't know she ever cheers up. Well, you need to understand, she's more at home with the people of the world than she is with the children of God. They're looking for something in the household of faith. And you have not given them. They didn't even tell you this what they're looking for. They want you to guess. They want you to suppose that this is what they're looking for. But you are not a good guesser. And because you cannot guess, and you're not giving them what they didn't tell you they wanted. That's why they're always gloomy. They're always sorrowful. And, you know, they're always down. But when they get to the world, then you see that they can be joyful, happy people. I will not be like that. Verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You'll not allow the people of the world to take all your attention and all your life in Jesus' name. Uh, let them point out something there in that uh, verse 4. We're looking at First John chapter 2. And we're reading verse 4 there. First John chapter 2 verse 4. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is, can you tell me? Can you tell me out aloud? It's a liar, and the truth is not in him. There are people that do not understand the new commandment and the new covenant. And whenever they want to do something, lying comes into what they do. They'll say, you know what? When I'm not wanted to catch Tema. His friend advised him to pretend. And then he pretended he was sick. And David came to visit him because David was his father. And he said, Daddy, you know what? The only thing that will help me, I don't have appetite, is if you sent Tema to come and prepare the food before me, and then I eat, I might get some strength. And David, he was a king. At that time, he didn't have discernment. And he sent Tamar there, and Tamar was defiled. And it was a sorry situation. Absalom then told Tamar, his sister, don't worry, he's your brother. If he has defiled you, forget about that. And yet Absalom had hatred in the heart. And Absalom went to David. Everything is on David. And they played the game of liars on David. I've uh, had all this my crop. And I want, you know, my brothers and sisters to come. And in particular, I want Amnon. Why? Why do you want Amnon? I just want to share my joy with him. Okay, Amnon got your brother, and Absalom had planned, and he could cover the plan very well and make his face good. And so he said to his servants, when the people are drunk 
And I tell you, strike, kill him. He was killed like that. Then everybody ran away. And eventually, Absalom went into exile. Joab was with David. You see, pretended love. We love, we love, and Joab was showing some love to Absalom. And Absalom said, can't you do something to bring me back? What is that? That I'm just away. All right. I will not tell David myself. I went to a woman, a worldly wise woman, and said, you will act like this and talk like this and present a story like this. And it was all lie. And the woman came to David, King, you are like an angel. Nobody can hide anything from you. But you know, even God will make a provision for the banished to come. And David said, wise woman, tell me, is this not a plot, a plan with Joab? King, nobody can hide anything from you. But you are sworn guilty of this sin. And I'm okay, Joab, you want that young man to come? Let him come. But let him go to his house. Don't allow him to see me. And eventually, Absalom said, Joab, I want to see the king. If I'm guilty, let him kill me. And Joab did not answer. And Absalom said to his servants, go burn his field. And Joab said, well, you burnt my farm because I wanted to see the king. And you didn't allow me to see the king. Okay, eventually he came to see the king. And he prostrated, and he made obeisance, all lies. I pray liars will not get you. And he acted out the lie, and eventually he stood outside. Anybody that wanted to come to the king, say, come here. What's your problem? This is my problem. Ah, if I were the deputy to the king, all this problem will be solved. But look at you now. And he stole the hearts of the people away. And eventually, he raised up some people and he shouted, The king reigns, long live the king. And David heard, and David had to run away. Look at all those people. They couldn't play that game of lying on Elisha. Because Elisha will have the discernment of the Spirit. I will say, Gezai, where are you coming from? The servant went, no either. Did not my heart follow you while you went after that man? Is this the time to receive this and that? And then judgment will come. You couldn't play that kind of lying game on Elisha because while the king of Syria was planning, well, catch the king this way, the king of Israel that way, Elisha will knew, no, he will sing to the king. You couldn't play that game on the prophets of God in the Old Testament because uh, Jeroboam said, my wife, disguise yourself. And go and uh, tell, go and ask from uh, the prophet Ahijah, will this my son survive or not? And so that wife was coming, wise woman, worldly wise woman, lying woman. And uh, as uh, soon as the feet uh, stepped on the door, Ahijah the prophet said, Come in, wife of um, uh, Jeroboam. Why are you pretending to be another woman? Come, I have a heavy message for you. You know, when you come to the New Testament, we have Ananias and Sapphira, game of lying. And then Peter said, Ananias, tell me, is this how much you sold the land? Yes, this is how much. How has Satan filled your heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost. You have not lied unto man. You have lied unto God. And he fell down and he died. And the wife came three hours later. Tell me now. Is this for so much you sold the land? 
tell me the whole truth? Of course, yes. Did my husband tell you? And she now supported the lie. And it says, well, we agreed together to tempt the Holy Ghost. You see, when we're real servants of God, and we're prophets of God, and we're raised up by God, the Lord will not allow liars to lie to you, to deceive you, to destroy you. You will not be destroyed in Jesus' name. But look at that situation I described to you now. All the stories I told you now about David and all those people. Liars can hurt the victim of their lie temporarily. But they themselves will be hurt forever, eternally. Where is Joab now? It's on the left hand side in eternity. Where is Absalom now? It's on the left side in eternity. Where is the worldly wise woman? And while the worldly wise woman told all the lies, when the trouble came for David, we couldn't find her. She couldn't come and say, I'm the one that paved way for this Absalom to come. And look at now, David is, uh, you know, suffering for that. And we can't find her anymore. And where is uh, Amnon that told the lie, let him come and cook for me and everything will be all right. They are suffering forever and ever. And Ananas and Sapphira, where are they today? They use their lies to hurt somebody temporarily. But they are forever and forever suffering in the eternal lake of fire. I will not go there. I said I will not go there. What do you gain? What do you have? If by telling lies you have this, acting lies you have this, and uh, deceiving other people you have that, and yet you now suffer forever and ever. There are pulpit liars. They come to the pulpit. They tell a fantastic testimony, this upon and this upon. When you go to the root of it, it's all lies. Why did you preach like that? Why did you say that? I say that to encourage the people to stir up their faith. And I, you know, told that lie on the pulpit to stir up their faith. What does it profit you if you have success in ministry and then you lose your soul? They are religious liars. They look at the Bible. They know what the Bible says, but they will evade the truth and religiously they will tell a lie. What does it profit? They are latter-day hypocritical liars. Their consciences are seared with a hot iron. And they just tell the lie now automatically and habitually. There are people who are service rendering liars. Ananas came to render service. Ananas came to give service. Is, but it was all hypocritical and lying. There are praise seeking liars. They're seeking the praise of man, and so that the praise will come, they now tell some lies, and the people are exalting them. But you know, those people that tell lies and they have the praise of man, or their position seeking liars. Eventually, when they land in hell, they'll say, but what have I gained now? What has that liar earned me? There are market liars. They're trying to sell this and that, and then they can swear heaven and earth, and they lie. You will not be like that. I will not be like that. Whatever I cannot get by telling the truth, let us in go. Whatever I cannot get by being transparent, let that thing go. Whatever I cannot achieve by the plain truth, by the scriptural truth, whatever I cannot achieve by saying it exactly as it is, I will lose that thing, I will miss that thing, and not get an earthly gain by lying, and then end up in hell fire. The Lord will protect you. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the all the sorcerers, 
They are idolaters. Tell me what follows. And all liars. You see the group they belong to. All liars. All forms of liars. All kinds of liars. Small, big, great, whatever, little. All liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You will not be a liar. I will not be a liar. You will not get anything by lying. Anything you are going to get, you will get it by faith. Any amen coming from there? Point number three now. The notable characteristics of not church concourse. The notable characteristics of not church concourse. We're looking at First John chapter two, verse five. But who so keepeth his word? In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Any overcomer here? Ye have overcome the wicked one. You'll keep on overcoming. Every day, an overcomer. In every situation, an overcomer. In every challenge in your life, an overcomer. And he says, I'm writing unto you. There are some people, they say, I'm strong. I don't need any preaching anymore. I'm strong. I don't need any epistle anymore. I'm strong. I don't need any exhortation anymore. I'm writing unto you, young men, not because you're weak, not because you are not strong, not because you are run down, but I write unto you because you have overcome the wicked one. If you are strong, still listen. If you are powerful, still listen. If you are a conqueror, a mighty conqueror, still listen. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because somebody there tell me, you are strong. If you are strong, praise the Lord. If you are victorious, praise the Lord. If you are triumphant, praise the Lord. If you are able and capable, praise the Lord. If you are bold and courageous, praise the Lord. But don't say, I don't need preaching anymore. I've arrived. I'm strong. I'm a conqueror. I'm a triumphant person. He says, I'm reaching unto you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome. And ye have overcome. And ye have overcome the wicked one. You'll be an overcomer in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading here from verse 29. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 29. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, as Jesus the Son of God overcame you will overcome. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You are a conqueror. 
you are more than a conqueror through Christ who has loved you and made the sacrifice for you so that you can be all you ought to be. More courage today. More boldness today. More victory today. Look at First John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 4 verse 4. Ye are God's little children and have overcome them. And have overcome them. All your tempters you will overcome. All the temptresses you will overcome. All the trials in your life you will overcome. All the challenges you will overcome. You have got little children and have overcome them because, because, because greater you see that is in you than he that is in the world. That verse is for me. I say that verse is for me. First John chapter 5 verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. I praise God on your behalf, you have overcome. First John chapter 5 verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. He will not touch you. I said he will not touch you. You'll be an overcomer throughout your life in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. They loved not their lives unto the death. What does that mean? The enemy used the threats of death. If you keep on standing, you will die. If you keep on upholding things like that, and you say that you believe the Bible, you stand on the Bible, you see what will happen, will kill you, you will die. And they say, no, you cannot. You cannot die until your work on earth is finished. Satan does not have the final say in how long your life will be. I didn't hear the amen. The Lord has said, with long life will he satisfy you and show you his salvation. Satan will not kill you. Demons will not kill you. The world will not kill you. The powers of darkness will not kill you. And so you understand, you love the Lord so much, and you are standing for the truth so much, that you are not afraid of the threats of the people, and the only weapon they have is, we will kill you, we will kill you, we will kill you. Say, they are liars. Tell the Lord they are liars. The Lord will not allow any of those people, wicked people, to touch your life in Jesus' name. I must read this to you before you go. Are you ready? We're looking at Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. And I'm reading to you from verse 17. No weapon of Satan will touch your life. No weapon of enemies will touch your life. 
no weapon of those people that are threatening her will touch her life. They will not take a minute, a moment out of your life in Jesus' name. You believe that? Say amen. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. No weapon will destroy your life. Don't be afraid of any terror. Don't be afraid of any tempter. Don't be afraid of anyone that wants you to compromise. You will not compromise. Even their master will not touch their, your life. They overcame him, the serpent, the devil. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Christ has died for you. They have shared his blood for you. He is your perfect substitute. And from now on, you can have the word of your testimony. The word abides in you. And because the word abides in you, every moment, every minute, every day for the rest of your life, as you stand on that, on changing word of God, you will overcome in Jesus' name. Next time, I will see you. Stronger, I will see you. Happier, I will see you. More courageous, I will see you. You will come with testimonies of victory in Jesus' name. You are more than a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. Tell the Lord, rise up and tell the Lord, you are more than a conqueror. Remember? The new comprehension we have of the new commandment. And remember, the new comprehension now, you exalt others, you lift up others, you help others, you promote others better than yourself. You have that love of God that Christ manifested. And you're not going to go into condemnation forever and ever because of lying, because of darkness, because of pretense, because of hypocrisy, you're not going to allow any of the lies of the world to seep into you, to come into you. You want to operate by the truth, transparency every time. And then you understand you are mighty as a conqueror. And as a conqueror, nothing will ever defeat you again in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord before you go.